there's a review that keeps happening. I think the person like updates it in some way, or um, I don't know what they do, but they ask the title is something along the lines of non Cassie C A S S E Y download option. One star, I don't have it in front of you, but it's like one star, and it basically says, I can't handle Casey, and I need to fast forward every time he talks. Well, we, we already do offer a non Cassie download option. <laughs> It's the non-Casey download option that, that's not coming. Feature already implemented. I believe it was last episode we talked about the time capsule and how that is or is not a acceptable way of backing things up. And, and John lamented how network-based time machine backups are really crummy and the time capsule is a piece of junk and blah, blah, blah. And somebody whose name I need to rediscover, hold on, let me fill this dead air by mumbling, uh, crud off to come back to it anyway nuclear uh, zen fire uh it was whatever's in the follow-up yeah um somebody posted uh a, a blog post and the title is time capsule backup versus syracusa so immediately i was intrigued <laughs> um so the a quick uh subsection of that post several weeks slash months ago my internal ssd suddenly died completely i hadn't made a clone backup or manually offloaded the data since the morning i'd been working all day and had many irretrievable projects that were lost except for the time capsule backup from 30 minutes before i went in the ssd or i sent the ssd in warranty and when it got back a week later i booted up the new drive with it connected to the time capsule it asked if i wanted to restore from the time capsule and i said yes and went to bed when i woke up in the morning my baby was back the beauty of the time capsule is its fire and forget usability that earns some loyalty. And I'm quoting, and Casey was right. My work what? here is done. I've just quit the podcast. I'm, and I would drop this mic if it wasn't so darn expensive. And chained to your desk. And on a mount. <laughs> and on a mount. Yeah, the time uh, machine's been around for a long time. Like that product's been around for a long time. And in the beginning, it got a bad reputation because network time machine backups were terrible, mostly for software reasons. So right away, out of the gate, it was like, don't buy a time capsule because it doesn't work. And how much of that was the time capsule's fault and how much of that was the network protocol they were using for a time machine, we don't know. But that gave it a bad rep. But even after they fixed the protocol, I've heard from many, many, many people over the many years that the time capsule has been out and the story has not been good. So I'm sure this person had a good experience and it worked fine. Like, it's not like it doesn't work at all. I mean, they keep selling them, right? But in the grand scheme of things, and all the feedback I've received over the many, many years, it's decidedly negative for this product for both hardware and software reasons. And it's better now than it was, but I would still not recommend anybody buy one. And that was Nuclear Zenfire on Twitter, like Marco said, whose first name is Michael, and that's all we know. So thank you, Michael, for sending that in and for once in my life saying that I was right and John was wrong. That's very exciting. Well, uh, he was wrong about it, though, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you John Syracuse. All right, so how do we want to tackle the uh, – well, is there any other follow-up? I'm sorry. I don't know. Is there anything really happened this week, like news-wise, that's really – I mean, Balmer's <laughs> fired. Someone, kind someone's of. not looking at the file. <laughs> oh. We have lots of things in there. Yeah, oh. we have a long – this is going to be a long one, so buckle up, kids. Um, Let's start with Balmer, because that'll be pretty okay. quick, I think. Um, okay. I think, um, I don't know, you know, we, we've we joked a lot about how Balmer has been performing pretty badly in a number of ways uh, for for years. But, you know, in fact, uh, Ben Thompson, uh, the, the guy who writes Stratechery, um, we'll link to this in the show notes, um, He he's a pretty awesome writer and thinker these days, and he... Uh, he actually spent some time at Microsoft, so he's kind of familiar with how it works. And he made a really good counterpoint to to this, which is basically that Steve Ballmer actually did a very good job with what he was kind of hired to do, which is take the ship that Bill Gates, you know, kind of built when he was at the head, and just keep it going. And Wait, why, why was he hired to do that? Who decides that that's what he was hired to do? Well, we can, we, you know, we can argue about that, but he did a part of his job extremely well which is he kept Microsoft going, he made them more profitable, he, he made them get more success in various business roles and, and you know, enterprise roles, which is a massive part of their business. So he did a lot of that well. But what he failed to do was push into any new markets and recognize, the, recognize new markets that he had to push into. And almost almost all of his uh, you know new initiatives that he was 
that that he tried to do over the years that were not related to the business and profit side. Uh, you know, almost almost everything he tried to do on the product side was mostly a failure. And uh, but it's kind of hard to say. You know, the board let him keep his job all these years because he was doing, I guess, well enough for on the business and profit side of things. Um, so it's not like you know he he wasn't necessarily like a complete buffoon all this time i w- i would say the board is more to blame for keeping him in that long when it was obvious that a lot of major product direction changes were necessary i can't believe you're defending balmer like the only thing you could say, like any defense of balmer has to come down to uh defending short-term thinking over the long term it's like yeah in the long term he screwed the company but you know day by day <laughs> he wasn't that bad like and they say well it's really the board's fault for not firing him like yeah the board does share some of this blame but bottom line is you know, if we look back on, on Steve Ballmer's tenure as Microsoft CEO, it's going to be he was the guy in charge when Microsoft lost it. Like they were they were the big dog, they became not the big dog, he oversaw that. And during the whole time, it's not like he like you said, it's not like he was a total buffoon. It's not like he didn't see some of these things, but as you said, every every time something was coming that was a threat, and he tried to counter it with his company and his products, he screwed up, he failed. Like the only good thing that could be attributed to his watch is the Xbox. And even that is not I mean I, you know that you have to say like look they entered a new product area they were successful uh maybe not totally financially successful but they are now a player you know a major player in the market and that's saying something right but every other initiative like they just they just missed everything like so in, in the micro level of saying well he, at least he was good at tuning their current businesses and he kept the money going and he, and he grew the company he did all this yeah but that doesn't matter like you know the, what matters is like what what is your legacy? What have you done? You you took control of a company that was on top of the world and you leave a company that's practically irrelevant. And that's how you have to measure, you know, how good a job did you do? And no, you know, it's not. Not if you're not if you're a shareholder. All you need to measure is are you getting more money or not. But look at look at their stock price over his tenure too. It is not a great looking. I <laughs> think you know, it, it, Tim Cook has only been around a little while. But look at the graph of you know when took, Tim Cook took over. What was the stock price and what is it now? And that's after Apple getting slaughtered in, in the stock market. So he didn't. I don't think he did any good for anybody except for the people who knew well enough to sell when the when the getting was good. The Microsoft stock price has been stagnant forever. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Like, if you don't, I, I think your job as CEO is not to just try to goose the stock price so people can invest in bail. It's like, if you care about the company, and surely he does because he was there from the beginning, right? If you care about the company, you want to make sure that your life's work is to build this company and leave it, you know, better than you found it, right? And I think that's what he cares about, and that's what we should care about when we measure someone as a CEO, not whether it's like, that's like saying we're going to measure someone's presidency by how many of their friends they got rich with contracts, with government <laughs> contracts during their tenure there. It's like, well, yeah, he just totally screwed the whole company, uh, the country, and left it in a worse condition than he started. But boy, while he was president, he got so many of his friends awesome government contracts, and they all got rich. That's not how you you measure things. No, it's not how you measure a president. You measure a president or a govern- uh, government by is the population's quality of life at least as good if not better than it was before that government came to office and that's similarly a, that, that's a high bar but anyway yeah well yeah but it's similarly with a corporation it's are they making money and specifically are they making money for the people who own portions of the corporation i mean i agree with you in the in, in to me balmer was a schmuck but in the end of the day did he or did he not please the shareholders and make the money because arguably that is the only measure that really matters no i, don't, I disagree that that measure almost matters almost not at all that's that's not what matters certainly not what matters to steve Ballmer. it's not what matters to anyone probably including microsoft shareholders because if if shareholders if shareholders are not just just about to die and, and need to blow their money on a big weekend they also care about the, lo- <laughs> the long-term health of the company because well, if you're fair. buying that's if fair. you're buying shares and you're not just gonna like flip them in like two days or something or you know some high frequency trading thing where you're gonna sell them 15 milliseconds after you buy them uh you care about the long-term health of the company because you're going to buy, hold, and hope, hope they go up and sell later. And you don't want it to go up 5% or 10%. You want it to double. And Steve Ballmer did not make that happen, is not making that happen. Uh, and that's but anyway, I, I think that's just a terrible measure of like uh, – a terrible way to look at things. Uh, and it's, it's really not – I mean just look at – the reason the board didn't fire him is because even they didn't look at it that way. Even the board of directors who you think they're – surely they care about shareholder value and everything. No, they kept them around because of personal relationships and – thinking that he was going to do it. And the thing is, he said most of the right things. Like, he saw the threats. He tried to position the company to counter them. He fielded products that were competitive with them. It's just that they all 
flopped, right? So it's not like he, he was totally oblivious. He just he just didn't execute, and it just you know he was slow, he was wrong, and he was just you know everything he did uh, had problems. But yeah, I don't, I think it was time for him to go. I'm glad he's gone. Uh, somebody could have done worse, yes, but <laughs> people could have done a lot better. I mean, I probably agree. his worst problem. Well, you know, I mean, you can look at his various failings. I mean, one of them is obviously, you know, not getting very well into most new markets, especially in the consumer space. Uh, one of them was just that he was so embarrassing in public so often. I mean, that like he really, <laughs> he really made himself and the company look stupid uh, on a very frequent basis. And I think, though, you know, you can look at what Microsoft has done and not done in the last roughly twelve years or thirteen or fourteen years. You know, since since around 2000 to now, and it's very obvious that Microsoft's greatest enemy has been itself, not anybody else, not Apple, not Google. Its its greatest enemy has been itself, and Microsoft has always, even from before Balmer, been infamous for infighting and having the, having divisions, especially like Office versus Windows. You'd have the, these these ridiculous, you know, infighting groups that would really hurt. The products that came out and and the company, but it seems like with Balmer that all got even worse. Like he he famously had the stack ranking system for the entire company, all, all these performance reports, and it's like ultra that, competitive. That, that wasn't him though. That that predates that predates him as CEO. Does That's, it? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's been around for a long time. Oh, okay. It, it's it's possible. It's I, been terrible for a long time. Yeah, at Microsoft. Right. <laughs> but you know, it seems like Balmer's greatest failure over the years has really been like not fixing or making that worse. Or like, I mean, not fixing that or even making it worse. You know, Microsoft could do a lot of things. They have a lot of smart people there. They have a lot of resources. I mean, they, they have a ridiculous R&D budget. They have ridiculous staff. They, and a lot of good stuff happens within Microsoft, but so little of it ends up making it into the products uh, because it's just, it's just slaughtered by the process and the, and the bureaucracy and the people and the strategy tax and the complexity. Um, Maybe this giant reorganization he was trying to do, which most Microsoft watchers think is a pretty bad idea, and it's probably what actually finally got him fired. Maybe this is actually his attempt to fix that. Well, it's aspirational. It's like, boy, I wish this is the company that Microsoft was, but it's not. And you know what everyone's saying is like, <laughs> yeah. that's a great vision, but explain to me how you're going to get from where you are to there, because that's a big gap, and you know people don't trust that they can get there you know microsoft's kind of got like a xerox park kind of vibe like xerox made all their money selling copiers and they had all this money and they made this research center and they're doing lots of interesting research and they you know they made nothing out of it. you know apple took the ideas microsoft took the ideas xerox did not become the power in the personal computing world that they could have been and microsoft had all this money from the pc business and they put it into r d and like they were out there with the you know microsoft pen for windows computing you know they were doing tablets way before anyone thought that that anyone should be doing tablets they made smartphones you know they were putting windows on phones they they were doing all these things like it was all there for the taking and they just they just didn't didn't execute they're like xerox they're like they were i mean they they weren't fielding ten thousand dollar auto computers that no one wants to buy but it was close you know like they kept making tablets and windows type convertible tablet things and smartphones and just all of them were not good enough uh and so they were there first, and they had the R&D, and they had the tech, and they did lots of interesting things, but they could not get a good product out of it. Uh, and that, that's, that's a failure of the company. So then other companies came along and, and ate their lunch. But they were, you know, they you know, snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. They had all the money in the world, all the <laughs> R&D in the world, all the right tech. They were looking in the right places. Like, sometimes they're looking in the wrong place. Like, interactive TV was the wrong place to look, and MSNBC was a shy side show. That's what happens when you have too much money, I guess. But uh, they were looking in the right places, mobile pen tablet computing uh that just didn't get there yeah and i thought um a friend of the show guy english's post uh, about balmer straight jacket was really interesting and, and you you guys kind of alluded to this earlier in that okay so now balmer has said we're gonna go all apple and reorg the company and now balmer's gone so now somebody else is gonna have to come in and either say oh just kidding or they're going to have to roll with this decision that Balmer made. And that's a tough spot. To, I mean, arguably being the CEO of a company that big, even when they're doing well is tough, when they're doing not so well is worse. And doing it when you're using somebody else's playbook that you may or may not be, buy into sounds worst of all. Well, no, so, no new CEO has to use that playbook, though. Like, that's the thing about being a new CEO. And yeah, it's embarrassing when you do the about face, but not that bad because a new guy comes in. Like, that's 
the new guy comes in that people expect him to like, well, now he's really going to clean house or whatever. And so your first move being reversing all your predecessors move happens all the time. Like that's, that's part of like the power move of like asserting yourself. So I don't think it's as big of a straight jacket as that post implied. I think, you know, the, the problem that post was getting at is that like, let's assume that this shape that Balmer wants to make Microsoft is a better shape than it is now. And I think most of us agree that the shape it is now is terrible. And this new shape looks a lot like Apple and Apple seems to be successful at doing the things that Microsoft says it wants to do, like be a devices and services company or whatever. So it's like, yeah, okay, that's good. But you know, how do you get there from here? And it's, it's not so much that you're tied into Balmer's plan is that if you also agree that Microsoft should be that kind of company and it should eventually look like this, now it's on you to figure out how to get there from here. So he could just lay out the goal, like we should be more like Apple and I'm out of here. But, uh, (laughs) <laughs> it, it, re- reading too much into it is like i don't i don't know why he got kicked out was was uh, was the reorganization his idea and then he got kicked out was the reorganization the board's idea and he just got to announce it before he got kicked out like there's so many things we don't know about the details here uh but once a new guy comes in all bets are off he could do anything he could he could p- pull a th- like that hp you know what's his name it starts with an a ap yeah when yeah. he came into hp and like said I forget. It was like, we're not going to make personal computers anymore. And we're, but he's, was he the guy who sold Palm? Or he made like 15 rapid fire drastic decisions and then got booted out. And then like half of them got reversed. And you're not looking for that kind of disaster here. I think this is just like one thing. And either the new guy is going to say, yes, I agree with that vision. We're going to try to get there. And that poor sucker is, uh, you know, going to have to do the hard work. But it's not a straitjacket. If he comes in and says, nope, I changed my mind. We're going to become like IBM and be a consulting company. Uh, then. He'll do that. Yeah. The, and speaking of IBM, the other series of interesting thoughts I saw about this was uh, another friend of the show, Craig Hockenberry, tweeted about how – I'm going to butcher what he said, which was, although brief, very eloquent. But he said, hey, you know, what Microsoft needs now is a Lou Gerstner. And as the child of a nearly lifelong IBMer, I can tell you that IBM was in a really rough spot for a fair bit of time. And then Lou Gerstner came in. And basically said, you know, we're going to shake everything up and we're really going to cut the fat and you're just going to have to deal with it because I have to save the company. And now IBM is not the biggest company in the world, but certainly one of the biggest company companies in the world. And it's doing, by most measures, very, very well. And so now we're kind of wondering, OK, well, that's nice. We know we need someone that looks and smells like Gerstner. But how do you find that person and who well, is that person? Well, I mean, don't you think he saved IBM by destroying it? The old, you know, the, the the village had to be destroyed to save it. Like oh, he absolutely. saved, he saved IBM, the corporate entity, uh, to making it into a profitable business again. Uh, but he destroyed the old IBM to do that. Like the old IBM was gone. This was the new IBM uh, because he had decided that the old IBM had no place in the world. Like, and lots of things were lost with that. Like lots of, you know, uh, IBM creator of the personal computer, and you know, like that. That's not the IBM we have today. They are more of a services company, and that's that's how he was able to make them successful. But that's not what IBM used to be. So, in, in some ways, IBM was reincarnated under his leadership, which I'm sure Microsoft watchers would be like, "All right, fun, go ahead, reincarnate Microsoft," because currently <laughs> it's like a lifeless corpse, and no one really is, is interested in it, right? But and other things, people, if you're looking for Microsoft to return to its former glory, you don't want uh, someone like that coming in and transforming the company into something you don't recognize anymore, even if the new thing is successful. And that's fair. I think that's very fair. It's, I just thought it was a very interesting point in parallel. Um, and, and I think you're, you're both right. I think that they could stand to have a Gerstner, but maybe that's not what they really want right now. And maybe they don't want to pivot uh, pivot their brand. Right, Marco? Nice. Uh, <laughs> well, well, like Marco said, if they, if you know, do they want to forestall? Do they want like, we, we want to look like Apple. We want to be like Apple. We want to be like a cross between Apple and Google. We want to have like Google's online services with like the Windows Azure stuff or whatever, because Microsoft still has some good tech and good products, which is a shame when any company, tech company is, you know, going down the tubes is like, there's, there's always good stuff in there, right? So there are good things, things to recommend. Even Windows Phone is like, you know, it's not actually a bad product at all, right? It's just that, they just, and Xbox again, you know, a product that, is something that could be something, right? So you're looking for someone to say, take all these things, get rid of all the bad things, but keep us as a company, the kind of company that makes the Xbox, the kind of company that makes Windows Azure, the kind of companies that make Windows Phone. Like we can do all these things. We're smart and capable people. Uh, Just make all those things successful now, please. And so if you want someone to do that and you're looking for someone with experience making kind of like we make devices plus the software that runs them on plus the software and services, like 
you could do worse than a four stall like figure someone who has experience in another company that is successful doing exactly the thing that you want to be doing here's a weird idea what if microsoft completely exits the consumer space so the the way this would look would be xbox would be spun off into its own company which would solve a big problem for microsoft which is making it profitable um that would be spun off um or sold, but probably spun off. The rest of Microsoft would become a lot like IBM in that it would be focused on business computing and consulting and enterprise services. Because if you think about it, their consumer stuff is where all of the losses appear to be happening in, in market share and relevance and, and probably in profits pretty soon, you know. The problem, I, I forget who tweeted this, and I'm sorry, it's somebody I follow who tweeted, you know, the problem that Microsoft has is that uh, nobody's paying for software anymore. And the direction well, well, on corporation, that, corporations are. Well, yes. Oh, they but, are. Oh, they are. But look at, you know, Windows and Office as Microsoft's two big cash cows. Um, look at how that, think about how that might be collapsing in, in the near future. Oh, no, and we, it's not we, see, go we see away. it happening. We see it happening. Right. Like, it's Windows, not going to go Windows away tomorrow, or... but it but... certainly seems like its best days are behind it. And so what if, what if Microsoft's future really is just completely exiting consumer stuff and, and only being enterprise focused, you know, high end office needs, all that, you know, basically if your office would, would have an exchange server or would use SharePoint, uh, then that's the kind of that's the kind of customer Microsoft wants to keep. But but those are not their good products. Like SharePoint is terrible. Exchange is terrible. Those are not the, like the, I I grant you those things that products that make money and that no one else wants to be in that business except for maybe like you know SAP or Oracle or whatever. But those are not their those are not their best products, right? And but so they if, if they, it, they are probably their most successful. Uh, and they're I mean, least competitive, or they have they have the lowest upside, probably because I mean that's what people are looking for is like what what is the upside? Like, do we think enterprise software that looks like this crap has a bright future, and that you're going to, uh, you know, grow the company by selling more of that for more money? Like the trend is in the other direction, getting rid of that stuff, using simpler things, switching to Google, you know, integrating with non Microsoft products. Like, so they're squeezing every ounce of money out of that. That's like their last bastion, and they've defended it well. And Balmer has, you know goose that to try to make it uh, produce as much money as possible. And they have some good things in the web services space that they kind of transition to. But if er anyone was going to look at like the crown jewels of Microsoft, uh, I mean, I don't know if they would pick that enterprise type software. And anyway, like you could make a successful I think enterprise. I would actually. You, uh, see, well, I think I, I, I would really consider it. You have no idea how much a SharePoint license is and how many, I mean, for the last uh, four or five years of my life, I have more often than not been working on top of SharePoint which is why I'm bitter and jaded, but it's, it's popular. It's extremely popular. And as, and you know, exchanges, I mean, th those are not cheap platforms. And when you get an exchange server or a SharePoint server, you're going to be doing that on windows server 2008, and you're mm -hmm. going to be using SQL server and it, it, it spreads quick and it's profitable. It's gotta yeah, be. But like, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a, there's a bright future in selling that, that kind of software to businesses. Well, no one uses it because it's good. You know, there's because it's good is it does not enter into this. Enterprise software is not about what's good. There's all these other factors involved, and Microsoft is pretty good at those factors. And there's no sign that's going to go away. There already there is. They're already getting disrupted at the low end. It used to be everybody had Exchange, but now you probably don't have Exchange if you are a smaller company. You get away with having like Igloo or something like that, or you use Google or something like. And you know what about sharing? Like we have SharePoint and all these things, but in our office we use Google Hangouts. We use Dropbox to share things because the enterprise software is so terrible. And we're a pretty big company, right? And we we still pay for all that Microsoft stuff, but like. It's being eaten from all sides. Like at the super duper high end, I don't even know if Microsoft plays there anymore, and that's kind of like rarefied territory anyway, where they have special custom systems for that. Uh, and then at the low end, Microsoft stuff is constantly being eaten by all these little web services. And even in companies that pay for these things, the people who are in the companies are, are choosing to use something else. It's like the way iPhones made it into the enterprise. Nobody wanted them. RIM had a stranglehold on it. They were great at serving those customers, but people didn't want to use them. They wanted to use iPhones, and that's that's the problem with the enterprise business that it's uh, it's surrounded on all sides by other things that want to eat their lunch and if people don't want to use your product like that's i did this thing uh, article on fatputs i think ages ago about what defines enterprise software or you know enterprise entanglements and why apple doesn't want to get involved in the enterprise space and enterprise software my definition is when the person buying your product is not the person that has to use it that's enterprise <laughs> software right because oh, yeah. that because that totally defines the entire shape of this product 
because they're saying, how do I, how I'm going to get these guys to pay for my software? And making the software better is not how you get that because they're not going to be the ones who use it. They don't care if it's better. All they care is, does this make my life easier as an IT manager? And so your product necessarily becomes shaped into this thing that IT managers love and that who cares if anyone else likes it because they have no choice, right? And that is an evolutionary dead end for software as far as I'm concerned. So let me take a quick break right now, and then I want to talk about a, a, another angle of this Microsoft discussion. But because we're a half hour in, let me take a quick break and thank our first sponsor. It is Wordbox. Wordbox is a simple yet powerful text editor for iOS. Now, this is pretty cool. Uh, these guys made it, and uh, it's for. It, we've had a long history with with uh, arranging the spot because they they initially wanted to uh, release this during the Dev Center outage, like that was when it was originally scheduled. So we had to bump them, and they were the nicest guys in the world uh, dealing with them and uh, and and moving this around. So I want to thank them for first of all their flexibility and how nice they are. Then I got a chance to see this app. And I got to say, Wordbox is beautiful. It is an absolutely beautiful app. Go to wordboxapp.com to see what I'm talking about. So it has, it's, a, it's a text editor. It has auto-saving, a magical scroll button. You can move the cursor wherever you want really easily. It supports multi-markdown. It supports text, text, uh, text expander touch. Excuse me. Um, it is all cloud-based. uses Dropbox. Um, it's really, it, it, it has so many features. I can't believe this came out of nowhere. Um, it has folder support. It has dropler sharing, uh, Dropbox backgrounding support, offline support, uh, exports to HTML or PDF from Markdown. It, there, there are so many smaller apps that I think this could very easily replace. Uh, word counts, emailing. It's really, it's really fantastic. And what I like most about it is the UI design. I mean, this, this not only fits right at home on iOS 7, I think, but uh, it's, it just is beautiful. And you can get it right now for iOS 6, too. It's, it's really a fantastic, clean modern design there's there's no like quote skeuomorphism around it's it's very clean and modern um and do you remember like the day before uh wwdc's keynote um or even that morning i think it was there was this company called flesky that everyone thought had blown a uh had blown a uh, exclusive about ios 7 supporting third-party keyboards because flesky had made their own keyboard well wordbox supports Flesky built in. I believe it's their uh, launch partner. I believe it's the first app that has Flesky support. So you can use this cool Wordbox app to try out the new Flesky keyboard and see, you know, so see finally like an alternative keyboard in iOS and and what that means and and, and what that could bring us and and how good it is. So really cool app. Uh it's called Wordbox. Go to wordboxapp.com or simply search the App Store for Wordbox. It's the it's the one with the uh, cool light blue icon with the W in the circle in the middle of it. Uh, but it's easier. Just go to wordboxapp.com. You can see lots of screenshots and uh, a video. It's really cool. Thanks a lot to wordbox.com or sorry wordboxapp.com for sponsoring the show. And uh, once again, check out Wordbox. Thanks. Yeah, it, I'm running iOS seven on my carry phone now, and uh, it fits right in. I mean, it it really does look good. So. If you're a Markdown person, you should definitely check it out. Yeah, I'm really impressed by the design of those. I mean, I, I, I know I said it before, but I'll say it again. It's, I, I love they, they have this awesome, uh, you, you can see it in the screenshots, they have this awesome uh, black slide-up action menu uh, where it, like, it like grays out the whole screen and all the buttons are the big circles, kind of like the, the iOS 7 dialer, the phone dialer. Um, really, really cool, and I was very impressed by this design. The prevalence of applications that do something other than the OS defaults for cursor control should tell Apple yeah. that their cursor control <laughs> defaults are inadequate. Yeah. Like I keep, I keep hoping for the, the OS release. Will they real? Like every time I have to do anything involving the cursor in a standard iOS text field, it's like, come on, Apple, come on. Every, and then now it's up to every third party app they have to implement their own thing, which is kind of good because it's kind of like a lab to try all sorts of different techniques in terms of swiping and tapping and like you know my, my big complaint is the weight. Uh, how long do I like press and hold? It's such an important part of interacting with text and selections in iOS and, and by default. Uh, but I don't like waiting anymore. And who is it? Was it you, Casey, or someone recently just installed iOS 7? I know you did as well, Casey, and then was complaining about the or was it you, Marco, complaining about how long the animations take? That was, I, it wasn't recently that I installed it, but I complained about it last night. Yeah, like I still haven't. I, last time I used iOS 7 was WWDC, right? So, but I, it's when I do install it, I fully. I expect to agree with everything you said in that post. Oh, yeah, you're going to hate that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't do a defaults right, you know, whatever hack to get rid of the animations like I can in OS 10. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Yet another reason that the Mac is superior. Anyway. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
All right, so Marco, you said you so, wanted yeah. to make another point. Yeah, one one more idea here to uh, you know to, to think about this Microsoft angle a little bit more. Um, how do you th- uh, you know, or rather, do you think there is a way that Microsoft could regain growth and and a foothold at all? But and but you know, especially c- could they grow market share again? Um, in the world of mobile, of smartphones and tablets, like, do you see a way that that could happen? Because honestly, I kind of don't. I totally do. Like, but like the company, things have to get worse before they get better. So, like, buckle up. Like, they're going to have to lose <laughs> a lot of weight, a lot of money, a lot of personnel, a lot of projects, a lot of products. Like, but you know, it's like when like when Jobs came back, he canned like everything basically, and said the whole company is concentrating on the iMac. Right. And then our next generation OS project, and that's going to take like three tries for us to get right. But everything else is gone. Newton gone, Open Dot gone, you know, HyperCard gone, like everything. Just, and like, I doubt anyone's going to come into Microsoft and do that, but they should. Because if you want, pick your product. If you want the Xbox to succeed, if you want Windows Phone to succeed, whatever it is that you want to be your thing that you think has an upside in the future. And I would say, like, you know, Windows Phone, tablets, and Xbox, and any television related things like that that set of consumer products probably has a much brighter future than their other consumer products. Those can be made in like, they're close. Like, you know, windows eight is terrible for policy reasons, not so much tech reasons. Uh, and as we said in past shows, they were the first ones to the new aesthetic. So they have like the right people in terms of design and everything there. It's just that, you know, all the other crap that they do and all the stupid entanglements and the fact that they have to have the desktop mode on the surface. And, you know, like they're just, they're their own worst enemy. And, uh, I I think they could turn this company around and pick a few of those great products and make them successful. The cost will be almost everything else they do. <laughs> but so. see, I don't I don't you know that worked for Apple, um, but there, there's a very different. That was a very different uh, scenario. That was first of all, Apple was in way worse shape then than Microsoft is in now. Yeah, and it's easy. It's easier to do crazy things when you're about to go bankrupt. And exactly. Microsoft is, and Microsoft is not, unfortunately. Not at all. Microsoft is actually doing. You know, financially, they're doing all right. Like they're they're doing pretty well. I think. Uh, um, so it has to get worse before it gets better. Right, but see, that's the thing. Like, I don't, I don't see that strategy working. And you know, for a lot of the reasons, like, you know, I, I wrote this piece forever ago about about um, Microsoft and Apple's respective customer cultures. This was back when uh, Windows 8 hadn't come out yet, but I think it was being shown off. And uh, I was I was speculating at the time that uh, Microsoft customers generally don't like being told what to do, and so they would probably resist Windows 8 if the new interface was mandatory, and they couldn't just turn it off and just always see the desktop again. And that turned out to be correct, that, that, that Microsoft did release it that way, people did hate it, and now with that whatever code name, Blue Mountain or whatever it is this fall, they're going to revert that. Um, you know, I, I think Microsoft, the reason why people buy Microsoft products is because the products let the people do whatever they want with their computers, and they don't really, they, they hardly ever kill anything, they hardly ever restrict anything. It's really not open in the sense of, of Stallman, but it's, it's open in the sense of capabilities and settings and stuff like that. It lets people do what they want. Yeah, but, it, but it's like raising a toddler and never telling them no. Well, sure. That's that's what they're doing with their business, and that like, and it's it's terrible. Like, like back at that old hypercritical episode where I talked about what you know what's wrong with Microsoft. Their biggest problem is that when they had all the power in the world, they didn't use it to subjugate the masses. To like, we are on top of the world. Windows ninety five has Jay Leno introducing it, and it's the greatest thing in the entire world, and everybody loves Microsoft, and we do everything. That was the time to. Put to, you know, say, and guess what? Our new thing is not even going to have a desktop. It's all going to, like, whatever the crazy idea was. Because at that time, you know, they were like, oh, my God, I don't, That you're right. They would all go, I don't like this. I want my old desktop back. But if you didn't give them the option, then Microsoft could have sat there with his arms folded and say, eh, what are you going to do? Go to Linux on the desktop? Buy a Mac? Ha! I mean, those were ridiculous <laughs> options, right? They had the power to turn their whole user base, as sort of Apple did, because the Apple faithful were like, you know, we love Apple. They're about to go bankrupt. We'll buy anything you make. Uh, teal computer i i guess like all right and this this <laughs> operating system that's humongously slow and has these crazy buttons the genie effect's kind of cool I don't, like you know th- they had a very small tiny amount of power and then grew it into something larger but microsoft was on top of the world and they could have they should have taken that opportunity to turn the ship now they're like weakened and injured and like Here's Windows 8. We have some ideas for new interface, but please, you can still get your desktop back. Don't hurt us. And that's, that's you know, I think they have more power than they thought they did. And I think Windows 8 would have been more successful if they had really committed the company to it. But you're right. At this point, like, people do have other options, and maybe they don't have enough power to, 
you know, to say you, you can't get the desktop back. Everything, all Windows 8 looks like this. And then IT would have been like, all right, let's everybody let's start our plans to convert to, I don't know. They still don't have great options because Apple doesn't want their business and they can't use Linux. So I don't know. I, I think their big mistake is catering to their customers to this real and sometimes perceived to be larger than it really is. Uh, desire by their customers not to have things change because it's that's that's what leadership is. It's telling people, no, this is the way things are going to be in the future. No, you can't have the old way back. Uh, you can't do that all the time, but at certain turning points, it's time to do that. And if you don't do that ever, you will just be left with your cranky customers who will never really be satisfied and who are a dwindling base. Uh, I mean, IBM kind of got into the situation too, or people selling mainframes or whatever, where you just keep selling mainframes and they just keep making demands and those mainframe people want mainframe features and eventually you realize you're selling to three people and the government and the entire rest of the industry has moved on and your three customers are still cranky about something. Well, right, but the problem is when Microsoft caters in to a large degree to enterprise, enterprise is always a big, slow-moving entity and if you're answering to the enterprise, they're never going to want new they're going to want new only when they have to have it because that means they have to spend money from their tight budgets to buy new. And so as long as they have they they're concerned at all with what the enterprise thinks, I don't think that there's much that can be done. And that kind of comes back to our conversation earlier, so how do you make Microsoft better? I almost wonder if as you got I think maybe one of you guys said it, if you just spin off the consumer business, however you define that and say, "You go do your thing and don't give a crap about the enterprise. Do what you think is right." And then the enterprise folks can do the, the boring stuff that, that the IT guys need, and they, they don't need to be as, as mobile in the sense of uh, agile, I guess I should say. And they can, they can continue to do the same old thing over and over until they eventually wither away and die. But, but say, say you tell the enterprise people, tough luck, you're getting what we give you. And they say, all right, no, screw you, Microsoft. You didn't listen to us. You're not giving us what we want. What do they do after that? All right, it's fine. Microsoft says, fine. We lose all your business. What are you guys going to buy instead? And then they're going to be like, well, I guess we'll like buy Google services or like where, wherever they run to. They're, they're kind of a poison pill. Say Microsoft completely pulls out of enterprise, says we are canning. We're stopping SQL Server. We're stopping, you know, Exchange. The only thing we're going to keep around is Windows Azure because that's like forward looking network type services. And, you know, it's not the same thing. You can't have it anymore. We're canceling all those products. And they're going to be like, but, 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 wait, no, fine, fine. Go to, go to someone else for their business. Whoever gets all that business is now tied down by that crap and those customers. So if Google got those businesses, it would, you know, unless you're really, really strong, unless Google also held the line, anyone who these enterprise customers went to would be dragged down by them. It's like, you know, zombies dragging you down into the pit of irrelevance, right? Because they're like, <laughs> oh, we, we need to see the, the roadmap going forward and you can't change things because now we're your big important customer and how many millions of dollars do we give you every year? And it takes a strong company to be able to say no to them. Uh, Microsoft can't do it. And if whoever they go to, like, I don't know who they would go to. They go to Oracle, <laughs> you know, have fun with them. <laughs> you know, or again, SAP or some um, so, some new company would rise up to, to take their money. You do not want those customers. Those customers are not good for a successful business. And if you lose them or intentionally piss them off and abandon them, they're going to have to go somewhere. And chances are good they're going to go to one of your competitors and screw them. And then you'll be free to sell like Apple. You know what I mean? Like Apple got out of that business for the most part, except for maybe a little bit of education. Uh, and it let them go forward and do what they want without worrying about how they mess with the, the, you know, the enterprise. They did a little bit of like, oh, well, okay, we'll change our iPhone to work a little bit better with the enterprise. But they, they are not focused on that customer. They don't do what the enterprise wants. Ask anyone who in IT has to deal with Apple. They do not do what, what a large company wants them to do. And I think Apple is freer and more successful for it. You know, and, and you're right. But also consider what if Microsoft pulled an Apple card and, and they, let me try to get these words out in a way that makes sense. What if Microsoft said, screw you enterprise. And then what if a different Microsoft product, the new version of SQL server, the new version of exchange that breaks all the old exchange, but is better in every way. What if that's what the new thing is? So they self cannibalize. Is that so terrible? Is that what it will take? That's, you know, not, if... that's not terrible, but like you have to you have to go into it with a new attitude, right? You have to go into it with like the attitude of, for a we're breaking everything, and I know you don't like it, uh, and, and we're hoping that you like our new product. But b going forward, you have to know the rules have changed. You don't get to dictate what we want. We are not going to hold backward compatibility forever and ever and ever just to make you feel better. Like 
you have to take more power in that relationship, which is different. They haven't been able to do it. Like, and that's, that's why I think it's, it's so, such poison to have these as your customers because they do pay you tons and tons of money. And it's natural for any business to go, geez, these customers are paying us tons of money. We have to pay attention to what we want. Otherwise, what we, like that's the instinct of a business. Do you know the customer is always right. Do what the customer wants. And you end up making your products beholden to these customers, who, you know, to these buyers who are not going to actually use your products. And, and it starts taking that same shape again. So you have to, it's very difficult to, serve those businesses while still trying to make a product that's good that that the people who are buying it you know the the actual users who are not actually buying it like uh, and i don't know if any company's ever been successful doing that apple solution was just like fine we'll exit that business that's the solution uh if someone's out if there's some company out there serving enterprise and government uh while also making awesome products that the users like uh Feel free to write us and tell us about it. Is it Lotus Notes? I've heard it might be Lotus Notes. Oh, God. <laughs> no, but, I mean, That's everything funny. you guys have just said, I think, supports the the theory of that Microsoft should probably split itself into consumer and and enterprise as separate companies or set or majorly separate divisions to the point where they could have totally separate product lines. Because you know, if you think about it. The, it the, trying to shove corporate windows on the desktop at home and on laptops and on consumer stuff has always kind of had problems. You know, back when, you know, Windows 2000, NT5, when when that was supposed to be the big unifying release, and it was so hard to do technically that they had to push off the big unifying release until Windows XP, and then Windows Me came out, ugh. Um, you know, it was it was clear back then that it was very, very hard to mash these two worlds together of consumer and and enterprise. For, on a technical level, and then I think now we're seeing a lot of that on the pro- on the product level, where and, and even on the on the company level, where we're seeing Microsoft is not doing a very good job of balancing these two things, um, especially when it comes to their consumer device side. Um, you see, like you know, the the Surface versus the Surface Pro as two separate products. Office having its own giant pile of uh, of politics and conflicts and issues in that world. Um, you see Microsoft not being able to politically and strategically release Office for iOS or Android, um, you know, you see these these pretty big problems uh, that are really hurting Microsoft big time. Imagine this. Imagine Microsoft spins out a new consumer company. They are responsible for Xbox, whatever Zune still has left. Basically, they're responsible for Xbox plus tablets and, and phones. Scott Forstall is the CEO of that company. Then their regular, you know, everything else, the entire enterprise and services side of their business, all the server software, Windows for PCs, Office, all of that is a totally separate company uh, that, you know, has somebody like Balmer but good uh, at the head of that. Why is, it, why is that worse? Tim Cook could run that one. He could. Why, <laughs> why is that worse than what they have now, like why? Because the, cons- the consumer side isn't making any money. There's no money to be made on the no, consumer no, side. No, I don't think that's the problem. Like, I, the, well, the technical problem is that like all those things that you just described share so much common technology that it would be very difficult, like legally speaking, how do you divvy that up? And well, they could they, license it to each other. Do they diverge or whatever? Yeah, but like when I picture that in my mind, what I picture is a rocket ship going up into space, and stage one is the enterprise business, and it it expends its fuel separates and tumbles back into the atmosphere <laughs> and stage two and three is like the consumer products and so it's like who's going to volunteer to be on the stage one that fires us up and then r- runs out of fuel and then tumbles into the ocean but who wants to doing be in that well. company the enterprise business i know well. but like um, they're the biggest rocket right they have the most fuel they have the most power but inevitably they're going to run out of fuel and tumble into the ocean like i would not if i was there and they were divvying up the company along those lines I would wonder how many people would raise their hands to be in that other part or to invest in that other part or whatever. Like it's like this is the future business and this is the current slash dying business, and uh, you know that's that's a tough sell. Well, too. The current to, one is the one that pays dividends and makes reliable money every year, and and the consumer no, new no, one is the like the potential one. growth. It's the shrinking one. I think those two things can exist within the same company. Uh, it just it just has to be a change in attitude. And I think existing within the same company gives you the biggest benefit. Because that's like using the booster rocket and not and not like this analogy is failing now, but like not not <laughs> not yes. not jettisoning it, like keeping it with you. Like so you fall you, you're gonna like 
it's kind of like what Apple did with like the Mac. The Mac, we have to get this thing back on track. We have to make one this teal so people will buy it. While we're doing that, let's work on the next stuff. And we're going to try a whole bunch of things. And the one of them that stuck was the iPod. It's like, oh, that gives us some more breathing room. Okay, we got to work on the next thing, right? So it's not like the Mac was like the office like cash cow, but like it was the only thing they had. And so job one was make sure that keeps making money. And Microsoft's already got that covered, right? That can power your company while you work on the other things. And when you work on the other things and if the other things are successful, like it's not like the Mac has faded away and slowly dwindled. It's been growing along with everything else. It's just growing at such a smaller rate than everything else that it looks like it's unimportant, but it's there, right? So you can use that enterprise business as your platform that will keep you safe and in the black long enough for you to work on the next big thing. And if you hit that next big thing, that part that's been help, helping you stay safe and in the black, that could be a successful business too and also still growing and also improving. Uh, so I think probably keeping the company together but just, you know, organizing it and running it differently is probably a better strategy than splitting it up. Because with splitting it up, I don't see good things for that enterprise company. And I see all sorts of crazy issues in terms of, like, the entanglements almost get worse when you have to have some sort of cross-licensing agreement or, you know, uh, coordinated development to maintain compatibility between enterprise windows and consumer windows and, you know, all that other stuff. You know, the thing it is is that I feel like we've been beating up Microsoft a lot today. And I think it's easy to kick somebody when they're down. But I think I I speak for all of us when in saying that I'm actually very hopeful for Microsoft. And I was thinking about it. uh, you, You guys made the point earlier that, you know, Microsoft was really early on tablets, and they were really early on smartphones. Well, maybe they weren't that smart, but they were certainly more than just feature phones. And so during those days, it was like, they had so they had good timing and they had decent vision, but never really executed. You know, they th- saw that smartphones were a thing and they saw it arguably before a lot of other people did, but they never really did it well. Now with, say, uh, Windows Phone 8, they had pretty good vision and pretty good execution, but the timing was terrible. And so I wonder if for whatever the next big thing is, the next mobile, maybe it's TV, as everyone's been saying, but I doubt it. But whatever that next thing is, maybe they will get all three of those timing, vision, and execution right. And then maybe that will really turn them around. And you could argue that maybe Azure is that thing. I'm, I'm not saying that is, but there you could pose the argument that maybe Azure is that thing. And I'm really hopeful that maybe one of these days they'll get all three right at the same time because it would it's better for all of us, even diehard Apple users, when Microsoft is competitive and good. Well, going back a second to the question I asked right after the last break, and it's almost time for the next one, but, um, <laughs> you know, my, 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 my theoretical question here, let's, let's ignore the question of whether the company gets split up or not because that obviously is, is a rat hole and it if for this for the purpose of this it doesn't actually matter um imagine what would an ideal microsoft product launch look like today in the in the phone and tablet area like in the general mobile devices area which is where all the growth is and which is what's slowly eating pcs uh actually not even that slowly um you know where is microsoft's place in this market cuz i'm kind of thinking they don't have one because here's the thing let's say they release of real, I mean, look, Windows, Windows Phone seven and eight, and Windows eight, were both pretty good. Neither, neither of them were great, but they were both pretty good. Especially for you know for for a Microsoft release uh, in the last decade, they were they were really good. You know, you can look at basically the last few things Microsoft did the, on the on their major platforms. Windows seven was very well received. Windows Phone seven, Windows eight, and Windows Phone eight. Those were all. Very well received critically, but in the market, Windows Seven I think did well, but but the rest of it, um, especially in the mobile area, uh, has really done pretty terribly. What could they do? Like what if they released something that was really really great? Let because you know let's let's say Windows uh, Eight on the on the Surface, you know let's say that was a really great launch. Let's say they even got the Surface down to three hundred bucks at launch. And so it was price competitive because when it when it did launch it wasn't. But let's say let's say they got it there. What could they release that would give them substantial growth and market share in this market? I don't think I don't think there was anything they could do because Apple has the premium end locked up tight. Google has everything else locked up tight. I don't really see room for a third party here doing similar kinds of things and and maybe they do something totally different but then what is that you know they tried 
a little bit with Windows 8 and, and some of the Surface PC crossover stuff, but that didn't work that well either. Well, I think mean, Casey was right that, like, that was a timing issue. Like, you either get the execution wrong or they get the timing wrong or both. And this was a timing issue. They released adequate some products with some interesting things about them that, that to recommend them, but the timing was, was awful. They, they're they kind of in the similar position to, that Apple used to be in. Apple used to routinely launch better products, but nobody cared. Oh, because everybody uses Windows because I can't run my applications on it because, you know, right. like the software ecosystem, like, they're, you know, it, it doesn't matter how, people say, it doesn't matter how good Apple makes stuff. No matter how good anything Apple releases, no one's going to care. But that's not entirely, it's just, it's just the bar is really high. So who would have thought that the solution was to release a teal Macintosh that will do it. Like, oh, yeah, now, you know, that generated excitement. Why did it generate excitement? Because it was a different color and it looked different, like fashion. You know, like they, they started, you know, they, they took a different tact and it got them attention. Did it, did that turn the whole company around? No, but that gave them a little more breathing room, right? Uh, and then the next thing, the iPod, which everyone shunned, but that turned out to be a great idea. Like, you know, it's... It's possible. It just it just is really really hard. And if you're really late, like if Apple Apple can't be the seventh company to release a translucent colored computer, no matter how good it is, they had to be the one to make the big splash with it, right? So Microsoft was not the first one to release a tablet. They were kind of the first one with the Windows 8 type look, but it wasn't it wasn't enough, and it was diluted and watered down. But there are you know plenty of areas where Microsoft could be successful with a new product. Uh, they just have to release it. And I would say even even the Xbox, an established category, could have been a, a runaway hit if everything had gone their way, right? So say they released a... Say Sony screwed up. Nintendo let them do what they're continuing to do because they're already screwing up. <laughs> Sony screws up. Uh, and Microsoft comes out and they do everything right with the new Xbox launch. And everybody loves them. And they end up taking market share from almost everybody else. They become the un- uncontested, undisputed platform for AAA games. Uh, because there's not, you know, the competition for that market is like Nintendo, Sony, and PC space, which is, you know, kind of sort of Microsoft slash Steam slash whatever, EA and stuff like that. That is a big market. That market makes a lot of money. And if Microsoft could have come out and dominated it, that would be a big win for them because they're already in that market. They're already, and, and this is a generational turnover where lots of things are happening. If they had executed it amazingly well, and if they got lucky and, and their competitors didn't execute as well, uh, that would be a big win. And all of a sudden, you'd see that, you know, making a lot of money for them. They could have made, like, wee, wee, wee bucks from the launch. You know, that's not how it turned <laughs> out. They ended up doing a whole bunch of things wrong, and one of their competitors, Sony, did not do a lot of things wrong. And, you know, it's it's like it looks like it's going to be a horse race again. But I don't, I don't count them out. It's just that it's it's going to be really hard and you can't look at what your competitors have already done and try to do it better because you never know what, um, what better part you need to do to make it happen. Like if you looked at Apple's like, well, what do they have to do? How awesome is the computer they have? No, they have to release a computer that's faster than everybody else. So they have to release one that is more reliable. Oh, they have to release one. that's a different color. What, what did that guy say? A different color, Pfft, whatever. Like that turned out to be the thing. <laughs> a different color was the thing that got them attention, and you know, turned things around, right? And I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm making light of it. It's much I more to it. I think it was that but, simple, but okay. But you know, I, you know what I mean. Like, it, no one would have predicted that if you had to ask. Like, okay, we're, we're getting killed here. We're releasing better products to Microsoft. What do we have to do to make people notice us? And if you brainstormed it. The guy who was coming up with the idea for like the iMac, everyone would have been like, that's not going to do it. Because in the abstract, it seems stupid. You have to see the concrete iMac to understand what it is about it. You know, like that's that's a difference in vision and it has to be executed well. But just the idea of like we're going to make a computer that that is designed differently, physically speaking, uh, that doesn't sound like a winning idea. Uh, but the execution matters. So if you said we're going to make a tablet that also doubles as a PC, I don't even know that's a winning idea, but certainly the execution where there's one ARM version and then like an Intel version with a fan in it and that you can put the desktop on both of them because they're afraid to go all the way, you know, like the the execution was not winning and I'm not even sure if that idea was winning, but I don't rule out the concept of them feeling a product that, you know, becomes very popular and uh, makes people sit up and take notice of Microsoft again. And with that, our second sponsor this week is another new iOS app. This is, I, I, lo- I love this kind of sponsor. This is my favorite kind of sponsor. Uh, it's another new iOS app. Uh, it's called Notograph. And uh, it's like Photograph, but for notes. So Notograph, N-O-T-O-G-R-A-P-H. And this is a pretty cool app. It's, you know, we, we talked last episode or two episodes ago about photo storage and, and photo stream and stuff like that. This is 
Notograph is a place to keep photos that you're taking more for like a note-taking purpose, and they can be kept outside of your camera roll, so they aren't clogging up your camera roll because you know you're not really taking like you know a photo of the label of a wine that you like. You don't really need that to be like in your family vacation photos. Like you're that's not the purpose that you're taking it for. And I use my camera on my iPhone all the time for this purpose, you know, for the purpose of of reminding me of of something that I want to come back to later. You know, you, you know, for me, it's often as simple as like the, a picture of where I parked in the parking garage. You know, I'll take a picture of the nearest sign with the letter and number on it, something like that. Um, or it, it can be longer, like oh, here's you know, here's a beer I liked, here's a product I want to look at, here's something I saw in a store, but I want to learn more about. It. I want to go read Amazon reviews, whatever the case may be. So, Notograph is an app made for this purpose. Um, it's, it, it's, first of all, it's designed primarily for quick captures because obviously when you're in these kinds of situations, you don't want to have to be filling with lots of navigation. So you launch it, it's quick capture, it, it, it opens always ready to take a picture. It has all sorts of sharing options, iCloud, syncing with Dropbox, uh, Evernote, um, you can email, you can, you can message, all that stuff. You can save these into your camera roll if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, it has a whole organizational system. You can create folders and manage all these things. But one of the coolest things about this, I think, is the UI. Uh, it's a really opinionated UI, and I like that about it. It's, it. It was designed with iOS 7 in mind, but if you take a look at the site, it's, it's notograph, N-O-T-O-G-R-A-P-H dot net slash A-T-P. Uh, go to notograph.net slash A-T-P. Take a look at, at their UI. It's very text-heavy, and it uses this awesome... Um, What's the font here? It's Tungsten by uh, Heffler Farrah Jones. Um, it's so it's a fantastic professional font, and it it is a very text heavy iOS seven principle styled app. But it doesn't look like every other iOS seven app, you know, because we're about to enter an era where every app looks you know white with Helvetica, Noia, and is you know all the same. This looks different. It takes a lot of the lessons learned from iOS seven, but it has its own style. And they have this cool UI mechanic where like. You know, to see the photos in a list, you need you need some kind of thumbnail. Uh, they have this thing where the list is a big rectangular cell, the way table cells in iOS usually are, and they have this cool UI where you just drag a uh, just a horizontal box up and down the photo to pick what part of it you want to be that little skinny rectangle thumbnail. It's really cool, very cool UI, very cool idea, and um, they even have, and this is pretty cool, they even have a video made by our friend Jonathan Mann, uh, the guy who, who made our theme song. Um, if you go to their website, notograph.net slash ATP, you can see this awesome music video that Jonathan Mann made for it. It's really cool. So I think this is worth checking out. I think you should definitely go get it right now to support them and our show. So thanks a lot to Notograph for sponsoring our show. N-O-T-O-G-R-A-P-H, like photograph, but for notes, notograph.net slash ATP. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the uh, thumbnail thing because that was uh, – I, I agree with everything you said. I think the thumbnail thing was the most interesting bit of the UI that I saw. And it was a really clever way to make a list that didn't feel like every other list that you've ever seen in iOS. And it, it is it is a pretty slick app, so you should definitely check it out. All these applications that use like a uh, – a, they, they want to show you your content as the item. Like they don't want to have an item that just has like a list box and like a thumbnail. Like they want, you know, for if you're sorting pictures or something, they want the pictures to be the item. Like iPhoto is like this on the Mac where when you have events, it picks one of the photos from the events to be the, the thing of the photo. The key feature for any application that does that is there has to be a way for you to say, you know what, you picked the wrong picture iPhoto for that event. I would like you to use a different one. Or you know what, Notograph, actually I would have – crop that differently so i could see like the name of the wine label that's that i took a picture of or whatever and that's the key feature it seems like well what's the difference that's like a power user feature who's ever going to use that but oh man it makes so much of a difference when you can move that little rectangle and pick which part you want to crop or by the way people who don't know in uh what is it an iPhone space bar it lets you when you're scrubbing through the pictures in, a, in an event you're scrubbing through with the cursor hit the space bar you still to use iphoto you want yes i do you, to pick the one you want for the event that is one of my favorite iphoto features that they actually added in recent years one of the few favorite features and uh, the fact that notograph has something like that is uh it's a great idea everyone everyone should do that that is not only is that the best syracusean uh feature pick uh that i could possibly think of but we have what i believe might be the perfect syracusean topic uh coming up next so uh, what happened with nintendo today uh, not much. <laughs> not, not much. Yeah. 
I think a lot of people are making fun of this product. We're talking about the Nintendo 2DS, which is not a typo. It's not a joke. Kind of like the name Wii. It seems like it might be a joke to begin with, but no, it's the real the real name. It, in some ways, it's kind of clever, but anyway. The 3DS is their handheld gaming system with a 3D, you know, you don't need glasses, kind of a stereoscopic screen on the top and a touch screen on the bottom, which is crazy in a strange Nintendo kind of way. But actually, after a fairly disastrous start, has started selling well when they slashed the price. And so now they're making a version of their flagship product, and the flagship feature of the flagship product right there in the name, 3DS, was that it's like a Nintendo DS, but it's 3D, right? So now they made a version of it without the 3D. Now, so can I interrupt you real quick? It, it, the 3DS, that folds in half, does it not? Yes, it does. It has a hinge, just like okay. the, the you know, there was the DS. And there's, there's like seven variants of this thing that are out there. I don't want to enumerate all of them. But Nintendo is not shy about making different variations. Big ones, small ones, ones with extra cameras, you know. Ones as big as your head. Yeah, like and and that it's actually not nice. a terrible idea because like they they make the big ones basically for adult size hands and not that I play handheld games but if I did I would appreciate the fact they made big ones. Uh, but anyway, the 2DS is getting rid of the 3D and the 3D has kind of been one of those things where it almost amazes me that they ever shipped the product because it's interesting tech. 3D without glasses is a good idea because everyone hates the stupid glasses. It does work as advertised. But you do have to keep your head in a certain position, or otherwise the you know you get the wrong image and the wrong eyes, and it doesn't quite work right. And they shipped it with a little slider that lets you turn down the 3D effect, and when you put the slider all the way down, it turns it off. So they probably have some kind of stat since these things are internet connected. Like how many people using our 3DSs that we've sold have that slider all the way down all the time, and probably determined that uh, that 3D feature is not as popular as we thought it was going to be. It apparently isn't a big differentiator for people. It's not the reason people are buying this. They're buying them. They're putting the slider down to the bottom. And they're leaving it there, and they're just using it like a, like a Nintendo DS or whatever. And they're really buying it because we make good games. So let's make one of these products without the 3D feature because we can save money. And the way they seem to save money with this product is, you know, by, by decontenting it, to use the word from the auto industry, like... Uh, Getting rid of the 3D that is surely cheaper to have a screen that doesn't do with that little 3D thing, so little lenticular things on top of it and everything. Uh, it doesn't fold in half. And I thought that was because they wanted to save money on the hinge because hinges are expensive on electronics and more moving parts and you have to thread you know, ribbon cables through them and there's reliability issues and all that other stuff. Uh, but what I've read, and I don't know if this is confirmed yet, but I've just read it, so by the time you hear this episode, maybe you'll know whether it's true or not, is that it doesn't have two separate screens. It has one big screen and they just crop out the top and the bottom part. And that's why it doesn't <laughs> bend in half because it can't bend in half. And one, one screen that's larger, like if you look at it, like the, t the top and bottom screens aren't even the same size. So if there's one big rectangular screen, that's the width of the top screen, they're just hiding part of it with the plastic uh, surrounding parts, you know, and they're hiding, of course, the middle part as well. And it seems like that might be more expensive, but I can I also imagine it being cheaper. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but that would also explain why the thing doesn't fold. Uh, and the final reason it doesn't fold is it looks kind of more like a tablet form factor. Like you can kind of squint and think of it as kind of like an iPad mini with, with like handles and controls on the sides. But then they put this thing on that makes it look like it's a top screen and a bottom screen. And all this saved them 40 bucks retail, which is not really that much, but it's a pretty significant amount. If you think of like if you had a consumer electronics product and someone told you, okay, we want this to run all the same games and be a good product, but you have to take $40 out of it. You'd be like, $40? How the hell do I get $40 out of it? I'm already using a plastic for the case. I can't really get that much money out for the chips and stuff. Like, maybe I can save a few bucks here and there if they have a, a die shrink of them or something. Maybe we can combine some chips and save a buck. But 40 bucks? how are we going to get $40 of value out of this, this handheld? And this is what it took to get $40 out of it. So it's cheaper. It plays 3DS games in 2D. Uh, it may be one big screen underneath the covers. They move the controls around a little bit. Uh, I don't think it's as ridiculous a product as, as everyone's making it out to be. I, I've looked at it, and I've seen, especially the video that Casey put in that he said is a, an embarrassing video, and, you know, come on, everyone can't make Apple-quality videos, right? But look at the size of the device and how it kind of zips up into the little bag. I would buy this for my kid if he wanted to play handheld games, and I think the kid would like it and enjoy playing games on it, and that's what game machines are supposed to be for. And I think Nintendo would actually make money selling them because they have, it seems, found a way to take some value, take some, not take some value, but take some cost out of the manufacturing process and lower the price while still making a profit. Uh, so I have to give this kind of a tentative thumbs up. What do you guys think? 
I don't know. I, I, so I haven't played console video games with any regularity in like 10 years. Um, we only have a Wii in the house, which is on only occasionally and usually only for rock band John Judge Away. Um, I saw the pictures of the 2DS and I saw the ridiculous video for the 2DS. And I don't know, it just, the, the fact that it doesn't have a hinge just looks and feels wrong to me. It it just looks like it's clearly something that was designed originally to have a hinge and now doesn't. And the thing that really kind of confuses me is that now you've taken a device that we think is designed for children and people with perhaps smaller hands and smaller bodies, and now you've made it bigger because it can never fold in half. But did you and see it, how big it is? I don't know if it's that much bigger. Like, it's still pretty darn tiny. Like, look at it next to that little kid who zips it up into his little carrying case. It is Are small. we talking about the video? Or are we talking yeah, about look the... At the, look at the video. Like, it's hard. When you see it just by itself, you think, you think it looks like, you know, some gigantic, like, I don't know, but like, look at look at it next to the like it's practically like a toddler putting it away. It is still small. I think it's still a reasonable size for a kid to put and tuck in his backpack to go on a car trip to have something to to play in the car or on vacation or something. Like, I don't think I mean, it's too it's big. Certainly, it's certainly not huge, but I don't, it's just maybe it's me and it, it. I just I don't get the way it, it it looks like it's supposed to have a hinge and just doesn't like they forgot it rather than it well, rather than they designed it out see the thing with the one with the hinge is a lot of a lot of 3ds games like there's shoulder buttons on it as well there's face button shoulder buttons and you've got the analog stick and the d-pad and and, and you've also got a stylus for the t- the bottom touch screen and some games try to use like all those controls at once and like famously i think it was the, was the pilot wings chat room can tell me uh not Pilot Wings, uh, Kid Icarus, whatever the uh, Kid Icarus game for the 3DS. Come on, chat room, wait for the delay to go. Anyway, there was one game <laughs> that uh, the Nintendo came out with that required you to use like the styles at the same time as the analog stick at the same time as the shoulder button. And the game came with like a little plastic stand thing because the, Nintendo recognized that trying to manipulate the machine in this manner while also supporting it is actually very difficult. So find a table, use this special plastic stand to prop it up into the right position, and then you can play our game. And that's kind of a failure of, like, game design and hardware design. Like, it's kind of ungainly to be trying to, trying to be holding, like, basically like a little miniature laptop that folds open, a little clamshell thing, while using all these controls all over it, and sometimes using a stylus and everything. Uh, I think the tablet form factor gives a better grip on the overall thing. Like the fact that it's just one big solid piece instead of some floppy thing. Uh, the chat room says Kid Icarus Uprising was the game, so I was close. Uh, I think that form factor may actually be better. For certain, and, uh, unfortunately, it's probably worse for some games that were designed around the clamshell factor because some games, like someone was saying that Metroid Prime Hunters, like it's going to be very difficult to play that game because it was designed around the position of the controls for the folding game where the, where the controls were lower down, nearer, nearer to the touch screen, and now they're sort of slid up. But I think overall, it, it will probably it'll feel more secure in your hands, this one piece, instead of having that strange hinge thing at various angles. Uh, so again, I don't, I don't think this is necessarily a loser product, uh, and I think they might sell a lot of them. And actually, I, um, I'm now looking at an image of what appears to me to be the 2DS, the, what was the non-3D one, the DS, and the 3DS. And you're right, I, I didn't realize... I that's, two, that's uh, 2DS, 3DS, and 3DS XL. Yeah, there's also the DSi, which is the same size as the DS. It's, and there was there was the old DS before they redesigned it. Put it in the uh, chat room or something so we can. It's, so that's where did. I got it from. It was it, from. It, uh, is it the joystick one? No, MediaLib. Dot. Yep. Blah. It's from yeah. Alex Sabinsky. Yep. So anyway, well, whatever it is I'm looking at, in, compared to that monstrosity on the right, it actually doesn't look that big at all. But that's the XL, if, and, that, and that's the one I would buy, by the way, because it's so, made closer for adult hands. So that's designed to be a monstrosity. I'm not trying to be funny. Yeah, it's trying. It's the whole point of that one is to be larger for older people who have trouble seeing, gotcha. and you know, it costs a little more because you have a bigger screen. But if you're an adult, you don't want to have your hands on those. Yeah, but you're the only things. adult wanting to buy a 3ds. Well, I, I <laughs> well, I don't. All right, I would already have one. I don't play handheld games at all because they're terrible for RSI. Like you know, you, oh yeah, the the you can't make a really ergonomic controller out of some when the controller is also the game system and the screen and has to be portable so i understand the compromises there and i kind of miss out on some of the games that i would like to play like i wish uh what is it gravity rush i gotta ask chat room again to confirm my memory is failing but anyway there's a game for the vita that i would really love to play but i'm not gonna buy a handheld gaming system to play it and i keep hoping it would come out for the ps3 or something uh, wasn't there some uh like third party or maybe it was first party box that you could get way back in the day to play original Game Boy games on a TV. 
Am I yeah, that there's up? a lot of there's a lot of products like that, and I I keep hoping that there will be some kind of product, or maybe the virtual console games where three DS only games will. Uh, someone says it's pronounced Vita. What did I say? I thought that's what you said. Is All that right. Vita? Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to say Vita. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I keep hoping that these games that I've been missing on handhelds will eventually come to a system that I can play. You know, somehow on my television, holding a slightly more ergonomic controller. Uh, in more comfort. So, so you're saying that tentative thumbs up for the, for the system. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. I mean, like, it's kind of sad that Nintendo has to go to these lengths. This is not a power move. This is not like, Oh, we're on top of the world. And now we're so successful that we can do this. This is kind of like, look, uh, the Wii U is doing really badly. The 3DS has actually kind of picked up in recent, you know, years. And it's not, you know, that has a chance for some growth. What can we do to get more money out of the part of our business that actually is successful? Maybe we make a cheaper version around holiday time. People more likely to buy it for their kids uh, because their kid wants an iPad mini, but we can't afford that. So we're going to buy a $130 uh, 3DS or 2DS. And honestly, I think that 2DS, like the games that are available for the DS, because it plays any DS game plus any 3DS game. So there's a huge game library available for this. And I would put the game library that that thing can play up against like seven App Store game libraries. Not that there aren't great games in the App Store, but the the depth of game available on that device and the type of gameplay experiences that you can have with buttons and shoulder buttons and sticks and a touchscreen and a stylus and all that other stuff just puts the iOS gaming experience to shame. Like, So I would be totally comfortable buying this less expensive device. Now, granted, the games are going to cost you more or whatever. Buy this less expensive device and like two games and, and the kid's stocking for Christmas and I think even though the kid wanted an iPad mini, if he's the right age and he is a gamer, he would be much happier with this device. So two very sore thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, real-time follow-up. Uh, Prehingra in the chat room says it was a Super Game Boy for Super Nintendo that I was thinking of, which it was. Oh, yeah. Um, so then, John, you kind of started down this road and then and then backed away. What do you think this means as a barometer for the health of Nintendo and, and their power in the marketplace? I mean, it's certainly, like you said, doesn't seem like this was the move of the king. It seems like it was the move of the competitor almost. Um, so, I mean, how does this make you feel as a Nintendo fan? Yeah, I think that it's a good thing Nintendo made all that money during the Wii era because now they're that their rainy day fund. It's now time for them to start using it, and I think they do have some breathing room to regroup. Doing these type of moves is like okay, let's let's shore up the dam while we try to regroup. And I really hope they are regrouping because they have they have some breathing room. They made tons of money with the success of the Wii. The Wii U is tanking. They have to decide: Are we going to try to recover the Wii U? Do we think that? Do we think we, they already did price drop on that? What did they drop? They dropped the the good one, the one that you really want, from like uh, three fifty to three hundred. Uh, so that's a good move too. Uh, the the reboot, uh, the HD remake of Wind Waker, which appeals to old people. Uh, is going to be available early in digital only form. That's also a good move. Like when you have a kind of like a, a, an important popular title that you know people are going to want, release it early in digital form to sort of, you know, reward people who don't want to go to the store and buy a disc. Uh, I think the digital one might also be a little bit cheaper. Like, so those are those are good moves, but like, are they going to stick it out with the Wii U? Are they going to rev the Wii U way before everyone else revs? Because there's no PS5 or an Xbox. We don't want to even think of the name. Those aren't coming out for many, many, many years. But Nintendo could, you know, produce a new console in the next two years. Is that is that their reboot plan? Or, the, you know, surely they're not going to stick with the Wii U for eight years. Uh, eight years from now, we pull out this podcast and play it back to me. Uh, so, <laughs> like, I don't even think that's, you know what I mean? So I would like to know what their strategy is, but I think they have a little bit of breathing room. And I think these type of moves are like, while we're figuring out what we're going to do, uh, let's let's see if, what we can do to get a little bit more money out of out of these good areas i mean a lot of their problem could just be software maybe that's their strategy regroup and we really need to be firing on all cylinders with first party software well to that end are we going to see zelda and, and mario in the app store anytime soon i hope not that's people <laughs> keep saying that i mean gruber said it today like they should start selling for the ios store like i whether or not that's like I don't think that would be a good long-term business strategy for Nintendo, the company. But as a consumer, as someone who plays Nintendo games, I would not like that at all. Because the thing I love about Nintendo is that they make hardware and software combined. They make a complete gaming experience. They tailor their hardware to fit the software they want to buy, want they want to make. 
and no one else does that to the degree they do. And I love their games, and I would not want to play their games on a touchscreen. Well, but you're assuming it's a touchscreen. Or with any of those little controller things that Apple now supports. Like, it's not it's not the same thing. Like, it, you know, I don't think they should do that. Nintendo doesn't think they should do that. I don't think that would make anybody happy. It would, it would turn them into Sega, where it's like, oh, all right, well, Sega's out of the hardware business. I guess we'll just make games now. And, you know, people are not excited about Sega games, even though they are available. Aren't Sega games available on iOS? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, a lot of them are. Yeah. yeah. Like, who and cares? No, terrible. Who cares? Nobody cares. Whereas, even as Nintendo fails... If they make a really good Zelda game for the Wii U, it will make a lot of people very happy, even if it doesn't make Nintendo a lot of money. So I'm one of those people who wants Nintendo to keep being Nintendo, and I would be willing to like have the Japanese government subsidize them to let them keep making it happen. I'm actually with <laughs> you on that. I, I think I think people calling for Nintendo to just make stuff for iOS is a lot like people who used to call for Apple to just license Mac OS to PC hardware. Yeah, it's um, exactly the same thing. I, like, I think it's, you know, obviously Nintendo makes a lot of money on their hardware, and that's the business they're in. And and so if, you know, licensing their games to other platforms would be really giving up, and, and it would it would probably lead to a, a dramatic uh, shrinking of the company and, and probably a lot of ruining of what's best about them. Um, the question is, you know, Apple avoided that by finding another way out of their predicament. The question is, can Nintendo do that? Well, Nintendo's weathered a lot of ups and downs. Like the Nintendo 64 was the beginning. The Nintendo 64 and the GameCube were another pretty big deep trough. We're like, oh, we're totally counting Nintendo out. And then they came out and over with the Wii. And now we're, you know, it's like it's like a roller coaster. So now they're on their way back down again. How long, how, how far down is this going to go before they make a U-turn again? Like, again, I think they're protected by, they're protected by their patience, by their determination, and by the mountains of money that they make during the high periods that they presumably spend wisely. Like, I don't think they, they don't spend money extravagantly. They don't have humongous staffs. They are fairly conservative with what they spend, what their burn rate is. So I'm hoping they can weather the storm and come out the other side. All right. And with that, let's wrap it up for the week. Uh, thanks a lot to our two sponsors this week, wordboxapp.com. That's the app wordbox and notograph, notograph.net slash ATP. And we'll see you next week. Now the show is over They didn't even mean to begin Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental John didn't do any research Marco and Casey wouldn't let him Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter E-Y-L-I-S-S So that's Casey Liss M-A-R-C-O A-R-M E-N-T Marco Arman S-I-R-A-C U-S-A Syracuse It's accidental What kind of weird reality are we in where I was agreeing with you, Marco, about enterprise related things? Well, you're the two uh, PC users, so you still have that, you know, infection and in, coursing through your veins in, tra- <laughs> tra- tra- in trace amounts. Uh, I don't even know how to argue with you on that one. You're probably right. I'm surprised you're so happy about the 2DS. Oh, not, not I'm, I'm not happy about the state of Nintendo's in, but I don't think the product deserves the, you know, the ridicule skin. Like it's not, it's not attractive looking either. There's many things. Very anything's against it. It's it's embarrassing kind of joke name. It's not attractive looking. It looks ungainly and awkward. But I think it's I think it's an okay product. And like I said, there's there's seven DS products that I think you can buy now. You can buy the I think you can still buy the DS. Then there's the 3DS. Then there's 3DS XL. Then there's the DSi. Then there's a the 2DS. What the hell is uh, the DSi? The, like they added a letter. To, I think that's the one with like more internet connectivity and extra cameras and. There's a whole bunch of like they they have tons of products. Do they still st- suck at internet and social things, or have they gotten better at that? Nope, they still suck. Okay, they still suck. Well, that sounds. I mean, weird. they have gotten better though. You can't say they haven't gotten better, but they are still pretty crappy at it. And like part of it is that philosophy of like protecting kids, and you know, like a lot of the things they do are to avoid what happened on the Xbox. We're like, hey, Xbox, the Xbox Live does it the best, but it's also the place where you go and will immediately be bombarded by teenagers. Uh, 
saying racist and homophobic yes. things to you. And <laughs> God forbid if you're a female, right? So Nintendo does not have that problem for the most part and has avoided it by keeping people away from each other. Like, you know what I mean? Keep them separated. Uh, and now hmm. they're slowly trying to allow some kind of interaction on a trusted basis. And, you know, they're, they're trying to avoid becoming Xbox Live, basically. <laughs> Which is which is sad because Xbox Live is you know with the exception of the uh, you know ten year olds swearing at you and calling you uh, horrible names, uh, it's actually very successful in a, in all other ways. Yeah, no, it is the best gaming. It is the best one, and yeah, it, it suffers from all those terrible ailments. But everyone's like, who is doing console online best? It's not Sony and it's not Nintendo. It's Microsoft. Uh, but Microsoft also, in typical fashion, like is that the price of good online that you have to deal with jerks? I'm not sure it's the price of it, but like. Nintendo and Sony were just mostly incompetent. Like they didn't, they didn't have, they had people who made games. Like Sony has less of an excuse, but Nintendo was like, look, they had a bunch of people who make games, a bunch of people who make hardware, and then all of a sudden they're expected to make network services. I don't even. They must have had to hire people to do that because, you know, do we have anyone knows how to run a server here? A what? <laughs> no, <it's> not, <laughs> like that's been the past many many years but they are getting better and they're slowly learning but they're doing it very cautiously i remember one of their first forays was you had to have friend codes which was like this nine digit number oh, or something yeah. oh yeah you would exchange because that way you couldn't accidentally see somebody who would say something terrible to you or try to abduct you or whatever right it would only <laughs> it was so hard to connect with somebody the only people who would ever connect would be like you and your best friend after six tries yeah did anybody oh, yeah. actually ever do that i did yeah no so i did we, uh, we played mario kart wii over the internet uh against uh friends of ours and this was shortly after mario kart we came out and i was on fios and my friend was on a reasonably quick comcast connection and it was a total disaster but that that's not friend codes well. that was the better iteration friend codes were back i think the ds someone in the chat room will tell me but it was before the wii where the friend codes oh the, the wii the wii the mario kart wii was like that was the improved version now see how much easier oh, that it was for god you. awful i know but it was still better like it was They've been slowly making it slightly better and more possible to do, but uh, they're a long way from it just being a free-for-all, and I think that's probably... Like, the the Wii U has a lot of things where people can scrawl notes to each other, and they must have, like, a fleet of people, or, like, Amazon Mechanical Turk or something, like, filtering out all the penis drawings and stuff, because it's just, <laughs> like... Someone, it's got to be moderated, like because when you if you go to a certain level and you and you you die and you fall in a pit in a Mario game, it'll be like you get to see a little message from somebody who keeps dying there too, and it's always something nice like oh I keep dying here, like and it's not like curses or vulgar drawings or whatever. So someone must be filtering all them out, uh, and I would not want that job. No, definitely not. Uh, uh, so goodness. our friend Ben Thompson, who we were talking about at the very top of the show, is in the chat room, uh, username Monk Bent, and he's asking me uh, my thoughts on the new Microsoft. Oh, God, how many words are in this title? The Microsoft Sculpt Ergonomic <laughs> Desktop Keyboard. It was the successor to the Microsoft Natural Ergonomic Keyboard 4000. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Microsoft doesn't have any problems. No, I, oh, they, they have the worst names of anything in the industry, <laughs> especially, especially their, uh, their non-critical products, like all the side stuff. Oh, it gets terrible names. I think Nintendo um, gives them a run for their money. New Super Mario Brothers Wii. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so far oh, we should talk about Jeff Atwood's keyboard too. This is pretty cool. The the code keyboard you saw. This? I don't. I saw that. I don't understand what makes it cool other than some dip switches on the bottom. Uh, I, I can tell you what makes it cool and what makes it a PC user's keyboard. What makes it cool is that it's a single person position for what a keyboard should be. So like that is something that I think Apple fans can get behind. Like regardless of what the oh, product yeah. is, like this is a single person's vision. Like he knew exactly what he wanted. And he made a keyboard that had that in every aspect of this is presumably exactly how Jeff Atwood wanted it. And so that is, there is a certain, you know, attraction to that. And he's really he, like, he's like a nerd's nerd too. Like Jeff Atwood is like exactly the kind of guy you would want to design a keyboard if you're right, a nerd. Yeah. And you may not like what his decisions are, but there's, you know, that's the Apple fans can totally get behind this. Like it's, it's an interesting product because it is a singular vision. Uh, but his singular vision is for a keyboard that looks and behaves like that the code keyboard, which is not to my tastes at all. I mean, I don't think it's even to Marco's taste because he likes the split keyboard, right? So this is not split because he didn't want that, right? right. Uh, if this has big keys with long throws and clicky keycaps, which I used to like, but now I don't. Now I need a very light pressure, short throws, like, you know, for RSI reasons or whatever. Like so scissor keys. Not, yeah, it, so it's it's not a keyboard that I would ever buy or be interested in i i don't think it's attractive looking either i think it looks like a pc keyboard because it is a pc keyboard even though you can rewire it for the control key i i don't think the 
the text on the keycaps looks nice. You know, it totally does not appeal to me, but the idea of it definitely appeals to me. And if you want it, if your interests and keyboard tastes align with Jeff Atwood's, then this is the one to get because some guy went out there and made something happen that, you know, that you could not have made on your own. You would have been like, well, which one of these 17 keyboards do I want? I can't really decide. But it's like this guy cut through all the fat and made the keyboard that he wanted to make and now is selling it to you. So it's a very, very appealing product, but I don't think I would ever buy it. And I'm assuming Marco would say the same. Yeah, I I think, you know, Jeff and the other people involved, but it looks like it's mainly mainly Jeff on the on the design and concept side. Um, they've made a really what appears to be I haven't tried it yet, but it appears to be a really good implementation of the same old keyboard we've been using forever. And to a lot of people, that's exactly what they're looking for. You know, a lot of people like it. it it's it's going to appeal a lot to the people who are still holding on to IBM Model M's or who fi- try to find them <laughs> on eBay um, because it's like you know it's like the keyboard and it's like if you want the standard key layout that's been around forever and you want a really good impl- implementation of that uh, then this is the one for you because it has everything that geeks love it has the Cherry MX key switches the big like you know clicky loud ones that are you know, that have great feedback well these it's are the backlit. quiet ones the Cherry oh, they are. are quiet are quieter. Oh right, <laughs> right. So that's, that's an aspect that he wanted. He likes the clear keys, but didn't like the you know calamitous noise that some of them make. So the the cherry clear ones are. He has a whole big keyboard post about the right. different color of cherry key switches. But right, fair enough. Yeah. But yeah, so it's it's a very good implementation of the same keyboard that's been around forever. My dream keyboard. So I, I got this Microsoft many many words ergonomic sculpt keyboard, and so far I, I've only had it for half of today. Um, so obviously this is not any kind of long-term impression so far. I think it's pretty good. Um, but they, they chose to use scissor keys on it and you know, you know just like laptop keyboards and all of Apple's recent keyboards. It, so it's like the short throw flat top scissor switch on the bottom. And, um, it's not mushy like the old dome switch. I mean, not dome, the old membrane one was, uh, it's, it's not mushy like that. Cause that was the problem with the original, uh, natural 4000 the predecessor to this one was that it had just the, the mushiest crappiest keys and uh, this one has like decent scissor keys on it um, i would say probably as good as as uh you know any apple laptop keyboard recently possibly even a little bit a little bit better uh, or a little bit you know springier or or you know firmer i guess so i like the keys so far um, i haven't typed full time on a scissor keyboard in a very long time so I don't know if it's going to be better or worse for potential RSI issues for me, but uh, I'm hoping it'll be the same just by the layout. It should be all right. So we'll see about that. Um, but my dream keyboard doesn't exist. My dream keyboard, the way I envision it today, is basically this keyboard with Jeff Atwood's key switches. And that, as far as I know, does not exist. And everybody always recommends this one keyboard. It's called uh, Truly Ergonomic. Here, I'll paste the link in the chat. Everybody always recommends this, and they say, why haven't you tried this? Oh, my God. And the reason why I haven't tried that is because of that ridiculous layout that it has. I really do not like ergonomic keyboards that have weird custom layouts. And this one is, you know, as weird layouts go, it's kind of moderate. Like, it's not, it doesn't go totally crazy like the kinesis advantage but it's uh it's kind of in the middle between regular keyboards and that uh so it's very very strange and i don't like those kind of layouts because that, that involves a very high learning curve and uh and it makes it a little bit difficult to go between different computers and and i frequently have to use a laptop here and there or a tiff's computer here and there or someone else's computer here and there and so i really like having just one standard keyboard layout that, that my fingers know and are accustomed to and that's it um, I also think the truly ergonomic one doesn't have the right shape. Uh, it's not... See, what makes the Microsoft keyboards great is they have this giant hump in the middle, and then it curves down from there, and they have this great negative tilt where the keyboard actually tilts slightly away from you um, in the, I guess, relatively vertical direction from you. Uh, it tilts away from you so that it's extremely comfortable. And and in theory, I don't know you know how many studies have proven this, in theory... It, it should be very, very good for RSI prevention. So Microsoft has a, has a great way of making those keys or those keyboards with the, with the best shape and, and the most usable layouts. Um, but so far, like the Natural 4000 was this giant ugly boat with mushy keys, and the, the new Sculpt ergonomic desktop keyboard is, uh, 
is uh, way better looking. Uh, I mean, it's just it, you could tell. Like, <laughs> I, I've already started writing my review just of like my initial impressions, and you know, it's so obvious. Like, you look at the natural four thousand, and you look at uh, if you do a Dell, uh, if you do a Google image search for Dell Dimension two thousand five. Uh, you will see <laughs> that's what PCs looked like in 2005 when the Natural 4000 was designed, and it looks ju- the Natural 4000 looks just like the PCs of the day. Um, by today's standards, it looks ridiculous, and, and not in a good way. <laughs> and so the the new the new Microsoft Sculpt blah 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 um, is quite good. It looks nice. The keys feel pretty good. Um, I like it better than the Kinesis um, Freestyle 2 for Mac, which I was using for the last year. Um, I like it better than that. And I think it'll be okay. My one reservation is on the the key type, and it being scissor keys, I'm a little bit worried about that. I think the key to getting any kind of RSI benefit out of scissor keys is you can't hit them as hard. Like the, right. the whole the whole point of them is that they activate easier, but it doesn't mean that people actually don't hit them as hard because people get into the habit of just pressing as hard as they used to have to press, and that's actually a hard, especially when you get like you know when you get going, you get a big head of steam, you may find yourself hitting the keys as hard as you used to have to hit like your mushy keyboard or whatever you're using before, and that's that's the habit to try to break. Like that's that's what I've had to do. Right, exactly. And it actually helped a lot. Like the um, the uh, Kinesis Freestyle Two that I've been using for, for about the last year has extremely light press key switches for for that reason. You know, it, it's it's not scissor keys, but it's it's very very light press regular keys. And uh, and so I've kind of gotten used to that. I think so. We'll see. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I like. I, I'm using the Apple Aluminum keyboard now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I since I don't type correctly, I have extreme difficulty with any layout changes because, like, I have you know, I'm using the wrong hands and the wrong keys. I'm doing everything wrong, right? So split keyboards like paralyze me because I, you know, I can't use them. And uh, but what I try to do is like do everything I can within a standard layout, which means very light key presses, but also like get it to slope away from me like that's all remember keyboards used to come with like kickstands in the back like it was just torturing yourself like like the more you tilt it up the worse it is like so well, even the natural 4000 for some reason came with those i don't know why like the yeah. natural 4000 it has this big stand you can put on the front lip that lifts it to, to get the negative tilt um but you don't have to put it on and it had these giant stands in the back that you, so you could set up your perfectly awesome natural keyboard to be terrible for you yeah people people expect it i know I this one the um the the clip on front prop thing is still optional although now it's magnetically attached so it's much cooler um but there's no more rear stands those are just gone so you can't set this up as terribly as you could the other one yeah so i'd say for people who have keyboards in there start off with just trying to make it level like let's start with that because almost every keyboard including <laughs> yeah. the apple Luna, has some kind of tilt in the wrong direction where like you know if you put a marble on it, it would roll downhill into your lap you want to try making it level just start with that and you can do that by propping it you can do that by if you have an adjustable keyboard tray just tilting that or whatever uh, and maybe you don't have to go negative with it, but you know, small changes can make a big difference over a long period of time. Yeah, I, John, I would say you know, given what you've just said, I think you might want to try this keyboard. It, it I is. Split. I can't. I can't do split. Like, it, have you ever tried really like giving it like a real solid try? I, I've never. I've never. Never given it more than a week. But a week isn't has been enough so many times to just. I because I just have bad, terrible habits that do not are not compatible with a split keyboard layout. And the thing is, like, rather than adapting. I adapt my bad habits to it. I end up crossing over my one, my <laughs> like, and, you know, I, I'll find myself doing that. And, and then I find all I'm doing is honing my terrible, increasingly terrible crossover habits on a split keyboard. So, well, this one actually has like a physical gap between uh, yeah, the I two know. halves. You could act, you could like, if you wanted to, you could stick like a DVD case in that gap upright <laughs> to block you from crossing over if you wanted to train it. Yeah. That, I think they would not. Yeah, you know, some of the chat rooms suggesting I learned Dvorak. The person next to me at work does that. And aside from being a mild security through obscurity hack, because whenever he leaves his computer unintended, it's more difficult for me to screw with it because I can't find what the damn keys are. Because <laughs> of course the keycaps are all qwerty. Right. Uh, yeah. Now I I'm probably past the point where I can learn new keyboard layouts or new keyboard shapes. But who knows? Like <laughs> typing is really not like I don't think that's my biggest issue. And you know I. I don't. I think my hand positioning and stuff like that is not as bad as it used to be. So I, I'm just going flatter and getting the keyboard at the right height is like ninety percent of the problem for was for me anyway. And I think for most people, because most people have their keyboard way too high mm. and tilted up. Honestly, I honestly, I really do think you should try this, even with the DVD case hack, if you need to, because I mean, obviously, you probably have a 
a more severe problem than I did. But like I was starting to get RSI like symptoms back when I like about a year into my first job after college because I was just constantly on the computer and yeah. constantly I mean, that, on bad keyboards that, 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 and. The keyboard, I changed the keyboard, and that was the number one helping thing, like, by far. Well, the number one helping thing is typing less. That is the number <laughs> well, one thing. Yeah, I think but... you probably made that adjustment, because that's, when I had my problems was when I had no life, and no kid, and, <laughs> like, and I was just on the computer from the moment I woke up until the moment I went to sleep, whether I was working or not, constantly typing. And that is, that that's what killed me. And, you know, if, when you have a more balanced life where you only type for certain periods of time and then do other things that don't involve typing for some portion of your waking hours. It's amazing things happen. So, no, I definitely didn't do that. I mean, I, <laughs> I, continued, I continued not to have a kid and not to have a life for about five years after that yeah. <laughs> and yeah. with no changes, no reduction. In fact, probably an increase in computer use after that. Well, you are lucky because I could not do that on no matter what I was using, mouse, keyboard, any shape, any anything, because just I was at my... And also my keyboard, my keyboard always used to be way too high. Like that was... If mm-hmm. I had to pick my number one thing that I did was, you know, once I crippled myself was put the keyboard lower. So that that's where I felt my biggest change. Maybe I would I, I felt a similar increase if I had got a split as well. But if I had the split and kept it up high, I would have still been killing myself. So are we getting to the point then that in the same way that everyone was making T-shirts <clears throat> uh, right before WWDC, is it going to be soon trendy to make your own keyboard? Is that going to be like the next big thing? I don't, I don't think that's something that regular people can do. I think you have to. I think you have to be Jeff Atwood to make that happen. And honestly, if I had to make or my John own, Syracuse or Mark, Olin. if I had to make my own keyboard, it would probably look a lot like the Apple Aluminum. I would just get those damn function keys away from my number keys. <laughs> and because that's that's the thing that kills me like i know they want to make it as small as possible uh but you, you know they're the, the little dinky function keys being right up against the number keys there's no reason for that like for years and years i was an apple extended 2 person and i still have a, a nice collection of apple extended 2s upstairs and that was my that was my keyboard that i used right up until the part the point where i was you know crippled myself uh, and I still like that better. Like, I don't like scissor keys as much as the Apple Extended 2, but I recognize that the scissor keys are better for me. So, like, you know, they be- they become more attractive because now when I think about having to hit those clicky keys, it feels good, but only for a short period of time, then it starts to feel worse. <laughs> so I thought, plus I thought your Extended 2s were your retirement plan, so you could sell them all to Gruber. Yeah, that's the plan now. Although, like, the, uh, my keyboard, my left control key, which is apparently the only control key I use because I don't type correctly, my left control key at work started sticking, uh, and I tried to repair it. And it's like it's the first I've taken apart scissor keys many, many times. Apple's scissor keycaps, and this was the first time I successfully reassembled it because <laughs> those things are not easy to put back together. Like, uh, especially if they come apart and you have all the pieces loose and you don't remember how they went. Luckily, now they have YouTube videos and stuff to give you hints. But it is a very tricky process. So anyway, I got the key back together after cleaning it out, and it's still stuck. So I got a new keyboard, but. Uh, that's one downside to uh, scissor keys is... You pretty much can't service them. You can. Like, I, I was proud of myself. I was so excited. Now I feel like I could take off an Apple scissor key cap and put it back successfully after only 15 minutes of swearing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, what, but when I'm done, it will work like, like it did before. Like, it won't be off kilter. Like, it, it was, if you look at it, such tiny little parts in there, it's amazing that the thing functions at all. It's extremely delicate. Tiny, tiny little flanges and pins and stuff. Uh, but I, there was something else wrong with that. I, I don't know why it was sticking. I, I brought it home with me so I can, you know, bring it down to the lab and try dousing it in alcohol or running it through the dishwasher or all the other things I say you can do on, on, on the web to one of these keyboards. Mate, what else is in the lab? You know what I mean. Theoretically, it's like the, when the Grinch is going to take your Christmas tree to, to check the lights. So there's not actual lab. <laughs> 